So we're going to uh, set the stage here with a few video clips as we go along, if we can just go with the first one, and we'll get going this evening. Jim McDivitt, Dave Scott, Rusty Schweikert, three men to qualify this new machine, to make ready for the moon. This was the most complex system ever sent into space. First, the Saturn V, seven and a half million pounds of thrust from its first stage alone, over three million working parts. Then the lunar module, well over one million parts. And the command and service modules, over two million parts. 35 seconds in counting. March 3rd, 1969, the countdown for the launch of Apollo 9 was underway. Each piece checked out before launch. The computer monitors. 20 seconds. Guidance release 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engines running. Commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, this, uh, this first question is for you, Jim. Okay. Uh, you know, this was the uh, third launch after the uh, disastrous fire where we, we'd accidentally, quite honestly, killed three of America's heroes. Um, though some years had passed, describe the morale after Apollo 1's disaster and how your team helped upli uplift the morale of the North American team, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I love it. First, first of all, you know, we not only have the three prime crew, but we have a backup crew. And I found out that we couldn't possibly, the six of us couldn't possibly do all the things we had to do. So we instituted something called the, the support crew. That, that gave us nine guys. Most baseball teams have nine guys. So one of our guys, uh, Dick Gordon, who's passed away unfortunately, played baseball for University of Washington. And he and the, the head of manufacturing for Rockwell were talking about morale and, and things like that. And so the next thing I knew, we were committed to a baseball game. I'd never played baseball in my life. I played softball, but no baseball. Well, anyway, so we had nine guys. And then Al Bean had his gallbladder taken out. So then we had eight guys. So, well, you know, we didn't have a backup crew. Uh, so anyway, we did get some of our engineers to come and play with us. And then Albert got better and he, we didn't need him. So uh, anyway, uh, we're gonna challenge the manufacturing guys. So I was over there one day look, looking for the head of manufacturing. I couldn't find him and just asked him, secretary where he was. Oh, he's down at the rec center with the team. I thought, I don't have to go to the rec center for my team. Uh, so I went down there to see him. He had about 200 guys out there, almost three quarters of them probably played pro ball. And uh, I went over and talked to him about uh, how many guys are you going to play? You know, you can't only play nine. So anyway, we had the game. And it turned out to be a really great event. Uh, we only had one rule that that was you couldn't uh, steal bases. And so our pitcher, Dick Gordon, started pitching and did a really good job. And um, 
after a couple innings, we're only behind by one run. And then, uh, except by then, Pete Conrad, who was the catcher, couldn't throw the ball back to the pitcher. He had to roll it back. <laughs> we weren't in very good shape because we'd only practiced once. And we, we called that off because the ball bounced up and hit Al Warden in the chin and knocked, knocked him out. So, so anyway, uh, it finally got to be dark. And the other guy, the manufacturer guy, came to me and said, Jim, you know, we might want to call this off. It's getting dark. Well, hell, we were only down by one run. I thought, maybe we can beat him in the dark. <laughs> well, we couldn't. We lost by one run. But the sequel to it was that we all, all went over to the Tahitian village, drank a lot of beer, had a hell of a lot of camaraderie. We had about 10,000 people in the stadium watching us. And uh, it sort of bucked up the, por the por morale. <laughs> The morale at the, in, the, in the manufacturing guys, at least. And I think it's the kind of teamwork that really made Apollo go. Okay. Oh. And, and Jim won the Golden Glove Award. <laughs> No. This is literally inside baseball tonight. It's amazing. As a, ma as a matter of fact. Who knew? As a matter of fact, when we were over at the Tahitian Village, they did give me an award. I had a, a gold jock strap that they gave me. Well, well, now we're getting into it. So, speaking of that, the owner of the, uh, the last jock strap on the moon, Larry McGlynn, is here tonight. I'm not kidding you. Gene Stern is with he Larry's back here. When you mentioned Al Bean, we miss Al considerably. Another one we've lost, but I forgot about his gallbladder being taken out. I think Larry owns the gallbladder, just to bring it all back. But that was, but a lot of this, what you're talking about, talking about building up the morale, that was the important thing because everything after Apollo 1 seemed to be bleak. There were people saying, that's it, we're done. Kennedy's goal is not going to happen. We're not going to do it before the end of the decade. Well, you but, know, NASA, NASA had a, a problem with killing people. And, um, well, so did we. Uh, we're, we're actually not going to talk about that a lot tonight, but, okay? But, but there, this is only the second question, so sit back. The, the, the administration I, I, I was I think very, we want to get over to Rusty, Jim. <laughs> the administration was very adverse to killing people. So there was a moment there where I thought we might end the program after the fire. Okay, Rusty. Rusty, oh, uh, you, you bad at cleanup, Rusty. Okay, so. by, the by the way, this was a successful now, wait a second, launch. Mark, will okay. you shut up for a minute? Yeah, just... you know, the one thing that we didn't, they didn't talk about when Rusty came up here, he was our in-house liberal. <laughs> he, he still is. Okay, uh, okay. He was talking about some politics there, but don't worry about it. Um, Rusty, Saturn V, okay? I mean, describe it. We just saw it in the video. Tell me what your impression of that was. Hmm. You know, I think the, the most uh, lasting impression of the Saturn V was when Dave and I drove out the night before the launch uh, to look at the spacecraft, to look at the launch vehicle on the pad. And of course, in the humid Florida atmosphere, with those incredibly powerful searchlights beaming up from every angle onto this, you know, phallic symbol, frankly, um, <laughs> gleaming, gleaming white in the, in the night. Uh, this is certainly going the direction we'd hoped, by the way. Yeah, so. right. It's going to be a sleepover tonight, so sit back, <laughs> relax. But I mean, enjoy. See, seeing that uh, Saturn V, which had flown only one time before with Bill Anders on it, uh, who's departed us tonight, but uh, in any event, so it was the second flight of that vehicle, and seeing that the night before, uh, probably 10 or 11 o'clock at night, we were supposed to be asleep or whatever, but. Uh, that, that's just an incredible scene because you know the next morning that that's going to take you 
away from this planet. And uh, hope it works, but it looks great. Built by the lowest bidder. That's right. So uh, mission goals on this. We'll talk more about this when we get uh, the flight directors up here, get Jerry and, and Gene up here. But this was essential. Every, every mission was essential, but especially this because of the lunar module and so forth. So, Rusty, your mission goals, big ones. You all had them, but you had a, it was a special thing because you had Spider in there. So talk about that. Well, as you said, Mark, I mean, Apollo 9 was the, probably, I, I've tried to think about, maybe, maybe somebody's got a different opinion, but I think it was probably the most ambitious uh, test flight, first flight, of any aerospace vehicle that had ever flown. I mean, it was incredibly challenging. Everything was new. Um, I think in that one video that showed earlier, uh, you heard Jim say that uh, there were all kinds of combinations and permutations of the command module, the service module, the lunar module, which had an ascent stage and a descent stage, and big rocket engines all over the place on the sides, on the back ends, you know. And every one of the combinations and permutations that were possible we, we lit that engine, we, we controlled that thing, and they were all different, and it was all software that had never been tested before, as well as the engines never being tested before. So that combination, as Jim said, of, you know, we could do it this way, that way, you know, all that kind of stuff, that was one thing that went on. But then in addition to that, I got the privilege of testing outside, as Dave did, but connected to the umbilical, but for me with a portable life support system on my back, the brand new Apollo spacesuit. Yeah. And if you look back at Gemini, we had a hell of a time in Gemini on the EVAs. I mean, they were at best partially successful. I mean, Buzz pulled off the most successful tests on, on his mission, but that Gemini suit was really a problem. Um, and we were all hoping the Apollo suit would be what it was supposed to be, and sure enough, it was. It was easy to operate and allowed the guys, my buddies here and others, to run around on the moon afterward. So that was, it was an yeah. amazing set of first time events. And keep in mind, that was just about two years after the Apollo 1 fire. You think about the speed with which this happened. Yeah. And the, the, uh, the, the, the technological know-how and, and the stick to it of this, it was huge. Tom Stafford, of course, could tell you about how much fun it was in Gemini 9 when he almost turned CERN into a satellite because that space right. suit was such a mess. Yeah. You know, Gene learned that the hard way watching Discovery, I think, one night. Tom goes, well, we're going to cut them loose. I mean, those were different times. And the Russians weren't exactly sharing what they were learning either. So, Dave Scott, tell us about the same, the same question on it, your mission goals, because you're command module pilot. So what, what, what was on your to-do list on this mission? Well, you know, as Jim and Rusty already expressed the complexity of the mission, uh, from my perspective, I got to fly alone and get rid of both these guys. <laughs> and I'll tell you, you've seen the spacecraft back there. Three guys in there, man, once they left, it was sort of, oh boy, I got my own machine. But uh, I might also say that Apollo 9 was probably, well, Jim and Rusty had to leave, got in a lunar module, went out to about 110 miles, came back, or were supposed to come back, and they had to use the descent engine and the ascent engine and the separation, and then get back and then dock. Now, as Jim said in another segment of another film, which is pretty cool, when they're asking, uh, if the lunar module spider could re-enter, he said, oh yeah, it could, not safely. <laughs> so it, when I look back now, the plan was if, if they couldn't get the rendezvous done, I would try to rescue them. In those days, the command module didn't have any radar. It didn't have any VHF ranging, which was required. And they had a radar which had big problems before the launch. So the risk that they took in the limb is probably the highest risk of any spaceflight ever flown. 
and I got to really hand it to these guys. They're absolutely cool about that. They're never any shaken or worry or uh, concern about whether or not they get out and get back. It was always, we're going to go do it. And they went and did it. So I always look back at Apollo 9 and said, I flew with two of the best guys who have ever been up there. Thank you, guys. Yeah, you know, I had to pay, I had to pay Dave 50 bucks to say that. <laughs> and and one other thing, he, he was supposed to be tracking our light with his uh, telescope. And when Rusty and I staged, the light went out. We blew, there's a big impact and I knocked the light out. And I hear Dave say, Spider, are you out there? Yeah, I want to hear why. I don't see you anymore. <laughs> and I also want to say that I was really nice today for about six weeks before the flight. <laughs> because I wanted him to be there when I got back. <laughs> did, did you guys actually go up in space together? Hey, you know, one thing I, I think is important, and we mentioned it last night, I think our crew was together longer than almost any other crew. We were the backup crew for Apollo 1 and worked our butts off for how long? A year and a half or something like that. And uh, then we were on Apollo 9 together. So it was, a, it was a lot of time together, but quite frankly, they're not that bad. Other than Rusty being a liberal, we were all right. <laughs> Okay, the, the, so these are these are my friends. Okay. Hey, Ru Rusty, we, I got a question for Rusty. Rusty, for Rusty. did you ever find the the music tape? <laughs> Actually, this is one of our questions a little bit later. So please answer that question. Okay. <laughs> this is a little bit of a story. You have to go back to 1969. We flew right at the time when the first Walkman, Sony Walkman, came out. I know that's hard to think back to, <laughs> but it was the first Sony Walkman, and we saw it as a way to take notes without having to get out a pencil and paper and write down stuff and all that. So we would be able to fly a Sony Walkman with a cassette tape and a set of batteries, and we could talk notes instead of writing them down. And that was a great plan, and what we found out as we were working this in the simulations was that one set of batteries were good for about 1.8 cassette tapes. So, using our head, we decided we would always, after one cassette of notes, change the batteries so that we didn't end up missing part of our notes on the next cassette. So it was always fresh battery. That gave us 0.8, battery, 0.8 cassettes left in each set of batteries. And we said, hey, can we fly our own music? And NASA sort of said, uh, uh. So we said, yeah, great. <laughs> um, he, he, didn't ask, he didn't ask Dave or me. So at any rate, we all got to choose our, our music that we would fly with us. We'd take up our own cassette of music, and we'd have that .8 batteries that we could play our music with. Now, these guys like country music. I don't have anything against country music. But I like classical music. We have a lot against And these that. guys have a lot against classical music. So what I have to tell you, Slug, to this day, I don't know how, but the cassette that I had of the music I played, and I played it again and again before the mission down at the crew quarters to the point where these guys got really sick of my classical music. It right? didn't take long. <laughs> So when I went to play my music, I couldn't find my cassette. 
And I'm looking all over the spacecraft, and there's not that many places, right? I couldn't find my cassette. Finally, on the ninth day of the mission, something like that, I'm going to have lunch, we're, we're lunchtime, and Dave floats up out of the lower equipment bay and he says, hey Rusty, I found this cassette, is this what you've been looking for? <laughs> and I said, hey, thanks Dave, I wonder where that came from. But here's, here's the interesting part of the story, okay, aside from giving him the bird, right? I decided, okay, screw you guys. I'm gonna listen to my, you've been playing with me all the time. I'm gonna listen to my music and have lunch and I'm gonna really enjoy this music because I recorded this music at home uh, for months ahead. I would sit on, on my living room floor, the kids, I'd put the kids to bed and um, nice little circle of light listen to this music all the time. It was very, very personal to me. And um, so I took, I took off my headset. Hey, you talked enough before. So, so I put on, took off my headset, said, you guys got the comm. And I put my Walkman on the, on the shelf next to me, the Velcro. And I took out my, my lunch. And I started to eat. And I pressed the button to play. And it started playing that music that had been a part of my life in preparing for the mission every Sunday night for months ahead of the flight. And that music hit me, and it just literally ripped me right out of the spacecraft, back down to those quiet Sunday nights with that music playing at home and the kids sleeping downstairs in the house. And I mean, it, I mean, we were in space flight, and it literally Tore, tore the heart right out of me to the point where I had to turn off the music. I couldn't take it. It was well, that we did, powerful. We didn't want you to go back down to Earth. We needed you up there. Let and, me and, say one other thing. You know, and Jim we, was playing Folsom Prison Blues at the we, time? We, we lost it. We had, now, now right. see, you know, this, is, we, th we this may confuse our we, audience wait, tonight. Wait, 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 the commander wait. wants to say something, Jim. He's... Uh, he's you know, that wasn't the only thing that was missing. When we got ready to go to bed, Rusty got in a little sleeping bag. We had crawled down underneath the seats. And I got cold, so I got in a little sleeping bag. And Dave started making a lot of noise underneath the, underneath the seats and stuff. And I said, Dave, what the hell are you doing? He said, I'm looking for the other sleeping bag. So after a while, we called down to Houston and said, Houston, where's that other sleeping bag? Long silence. It's down here in the ground. We didn't put it in. <laughs> so Dave, Dave had a very cold night, <laughs> a number of nights. So, so let's review. Tonight we've heard some inside stories. We had a lot of baseball stories. And right now it feels like I'm in an episode of Dr. Phil. Well, you, you see. What, what, what did you know was you love? See, we, we were partially mistaken. Yes. We were going to ask you questions like, this mission has been defined as a test pilot's dream mission. Yes, that's a good Defined. Yes. But the music is okay with us. Okay? That's okay. So we want good, you to good. Know we can go beyond that. Okay, okay. Have a philosophy okay. or religion. I mean, we can do all that. Okay, so test pilot's dream mission. Dave? Well, I think the, the beauty of the mission were the things we got to do. I mean, we're very fortunate to have been assigned that mission and to have all the pieces put in there to test. So as a test pilot, why, we had a chance to demonstrate that we could prove something, run something, make it work, find out if it doesn't work, correct it, and whatever. So there are a lot of pieces. And the lunar module, of course, is one. But we've mentioned also that Rusty had the first backpack to be used on Apollo, the portable life support system. And it's sort of overlooked in a lot of the things that we got to do. But Rusty tested it. It worked perfectly. And the next person who wore it on the moon was Neil Armstrong. Hmm. And it worked. And it worked every time on the moon. There was never a failure of the Pliss. Never. And Rusty was the guy who tested it. Yeah. So. And then, I haven't thought about that before. 
So then the, some of the other parts that were really interesting, that were fun, but challenging too. You all know that Apollo 13 got back because of the so-called lifeboat maneuver, where the lunar module was used as a propulsion system to get them home. Few people know that on Apollo 9, we tested that concept. So Jim and Rusty got in the lunar module and pretended like the command module was inert or dead, and they ran that particular maneuver with the LEM engines, and it worked. So part of the test pilot's job is to try things that may be used or may not be used. So all these things we got to do were things that were used or not used, but actually a lot of fun to do, but challenging. You know, and I'll, I'll mention one thing on Rusty's music. <laughs> you know. Why? After, <laughs> after. Sounds like the music was the challenge. No, actually, 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 it really wasn't so bad. I got to apologize oh, for it. Wasn't it. it wasn't so bad. When you I've get never to, heard this before. When, Go, when, Dave. When, when you got to the ninth day out of 10 days and you're getting ready for a meal, Rusty's music wasn't as bad as Tang. <laughs> okay, let's go with the let's go with the next clip, please. Let's watch this. Uh, Houston, just for info, the tunnel uh, clearing went uh, pretty much according to plan. Apollo nine, Houston's reading your line clear. Roger, I know a little piece of info for you. The uh, drogue looks as good as new. Uh, Roger, Apollo 9. With two spacecraft now in operation, new code names were introduced. The cone-shaped command module known as Gumdrop, the insect-like lunar module called Spider. Throughout the day, McDivitt and Schweikert would test every system of the lunar module. The major event of the day would be a burn of the lunar module descent engine. This engine, which will eventually be used for the actual lunar landing, would be under the manual control of spacecraft commander McDivitt for a large portion of the burn. Okay, ignition. Now, McDivitt put on a virtuoso performance, playing the throttle of the lunar module, each variation of thrust a note in a technological symphony. Trying the throttle. 40%. Going down at 10%. Coming back up to 40%. Coming back down to 25%. Back up again. Okay, coming up to 40%. Throttle profile is complete. Just let it sit there. All right, Dave. How important were simulations? and practice, so a lot of practice before you actually go on the flight, a lot of simulator activities. So tell us more about that, how many hours, what was it like, all the simulations? Well, simulations are really the key to preparing for the moon and training for the crew in particular, but also for mission control. Towards the end of the training period, uh, we had what we call integrated sims with mission control. That is, communications link would be set up among MCC, the command module, and the lunar module, and then we would run a certain part of the mission, but there was a crew called Sim Soup behind some glass who wrote a script on putting failures in. And the idea was to see if the crew and MCC could handle failures. <clears throat> and it was an insidious thing because we didn't know what the script would be. And at the same time, many of the managers in their nice offices with their closed circuit TV knew what the script was. So as we go through a sim, sim soup would throw in a big problem, and then everybody is watching us to see how we perform. And talk about a final exam. Well, you got all the bosses and MC and everybody watching, you perform. So it was a great method of teaching the crew how to operate in space, as well as to coordinate with MCC, which was essential to solve some of the potential problems. Now, on Apollo 9, things again were new. We had two simulators, separate simulators, and one of the big problems prior to the mission was we could not get all three simulators, MCC, Jerry Griffin and Gene Kranz, and the Spider, 
and Gumdrop to play together. They wouldn't work together. And about two months before the flight, I recall this, the bosses came down from Washington, Rocco Patron and all of Bay Heads, to find out if we couldn't get the simulators running. Because they knew if we couldn't get them running and go so through some of these integrated sims, we couldn't launch. And they put it on Jim. And they said, OK, Jim, if you're not convinced that the sims work properly next week or next month, I forget when it was, OK, you're not launching. Guess what? He got the whip out. He got the poor sim and the other guys. And he whipped them at night and finally got them to go. But it finally played. But the simulators were really key to the whole operation. And it helped us learn how to work together. And it also helped create the names. Before Apollo 9, NASA said, no names for spacecraft. You can't name spacecraft anymore. Gus tried to on Gemini, and they wouldn't let him. So OK, we got into the simulations, and we thought, well, you can't say, hey, Apollo 9, this is Apollo 9. I mean, I couldn't talk to Jim and Rusty from the command module, and everybody uses Apollo 9, so we picked some call signs. And obviously, the call sign for the lunar module was spider. It looked like a spider. So we picked the call sign for the command module, gumdrop. And the reason is, when that, the shape of the spacecraft leaves Downey on a truck, it's wrapped in blue cellophane. And it looks like a blue gumdrop. So the spider looked like spider, and the gumdrop looked like gumdrop. And we used them as call signs. Subsequently, every mission got the name of spacecraft. So it's another benefit of simulations. <laughs> Well, what, what I liked about it was I was going to name Gemini 4 the American Eagle, and we were told, no, it's going to be called Gemini 4. So I had the opportunity of being the first guy to not be able to name a spacecraft, and then we all got the opportunity to name one. <laughs> I, I remember us naming those spacecraft at the bar in Downey <laughs> one night when we designed the patch. Now remember, everything yeah. that happens here stays here. Right. <laughs> well, and, Facebook's and, been broken and, all day. And, It'll and be I, fine. Be, I became Red Rover because I was a separate spacecraft. Uh, and so we had actually three spacecraft when I did the EVA. And it was Red Rover, Red Rover, come over. You know, kids right. came. And, right. and, and you came up with that at the bar. Right. Where some of the finest work has been done in NASA we over the came, years. We came up with a lot of things well, at the well, bar. The way I see it, you were at the bar because NASA was trying to kill you. Is that right? Well, so, apparently, there's a lot, lot of that going on. The, now, Tahitian, we, we, the Tahitian village was a vital part of this <laughs> Apollo program. So are a lot of places at Cocoa Beach, but that's a separate evening. The Tahitian village was in, in California, well, yeah, in yeah, Downey. The, the, the road is speckled with... with